We are in the, uh, the, the end of Hebrews chapter 13. We're, we're coming to a close of the book. We're in the final words uh, in the entire book. And we'll go through these few verses and then we'll uh, just basically give an overview of certain things of the book. Uh, just as uh, a quick review of certain things. Not everything, but there's, there's too much. Uh, but uh, just certain things. But we, we begin in verse uh, 18. So we're in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18. And here the writer is calling for his first audience, whoever they are, whoever he is, whoever they are. He says, pray for us. So there's more, he, there's more than just him involved in this. Now he's the writer, whoever that is. But his audience, once again, whoever they are, we, it's a, got to, it has to be a congregation somewhere. They don't know where. But they know it's more than one person, that whoever the writer is, that there are others with him that they know. But he says, pray for us. And we can, it's not a generic us. As in, you know, people you don't know, just generally speaking, us. Uh, but we'll see that it's more than that. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. All right, we'll get to that in a second. But we see the writer's not alone. All right, and he wants them to pray for him, as we'll see in the next verse that to be able to see them sooner rather than later. And whoever's writing this also has a reason why he can't be there with them. Uh, and, um, uh, but here he, uh, he's calling for them, pray for us. We live in a good, uh, we have a good conscience, okay, in all things desiring to live honorably, but I especially urge you to do this, that is pray for us, I especially urge you to pray for us that I may be restored to you the sooner. He has a history with them and the author wants to return to them, but it, and it, and it may not be too long to wait to begin with, but here is more the sooner. And uh, the reason I, I want to bring out that it, it may not be too long of a wait for him to get there, but he wants to get there sooner. And so, yeah, that would imply, that would imply that, that he wants to get there the sooner, meaning that he could go and see them soon, as in the next few months, I don't know, but he wants to be able to do it sooner, as in the next few weeks. Uh, now, verse 20, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will. And we'll stop right there. So here are these parting words. These parting words. One, pray for me. Now this hope that the God of peace, the one who brought up Jesus from the dead, Jesus who is the great shepherd of, of the sheep, the one who has an everlasting covenant through His blood, that He'll make you complete in every good work to do His will. There are things that are to be done, and He is hoping that they will do them. He's already made mention that going back to chapters 5 and 6, that there are things that they ought to be doing that they're not doing. They ought to be teachers by now, but they're not. They ought to have learned more by now, but they haven't. They should have increased in the Word. They should have increased in their learning. They should have increased in their understanding, but they haven't. They are, they are stagnant. They are mired down in something. 
and he is calling them to, it's time to grow. It's time to get going. It's time to move on in this. But he does commend them for the good works that they have done and the good works that they continue to do. So not everything is bad. But he's telling them that they, uh, that Christ would make them complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so He is urging them, He's been urging them to grow. Now is this, basically this prayer that they will grow, that there are good works they could be doing, they're just not doing it. There are things they could, they could be growing into, but they're just not growing. They're not doing it. There's improvement that is to be done. Now, verse 22, And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation as I have written to you in few words. Okay? So bear with the words of exhortation. What does that mean? That means that, yes, in this letter, he has giving them, given them some rebuke. He has given them some exhortation. And they are to bear with it. They are to use it for the right purpose. For the purpose in which it was given. It's given by the Holy Spirit. For the purpose in which it was given. Not to uh, go against it. Not to... Ignore it, not to think that, yes, they have, you know, there, there's nothing they have that uh, needs improvement whatsoever, that they will take these words of uh, exhortation and use it. Now, let's just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll see where there is a congregation, at least for a moment in time, that they were not taking exhortation. They were not taking uh, the, uh, the genuine concern that brethren had and uh, an actual rebuke that you need to stop this, you need to put an end to this, you need to correct this, and they weren't correcting it. They weren't doing it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. All right? The, the, this is, this is a, a new thing, even for the Corinthians at large. The Corinthian population, who's, you know, uh, they, uh, they were already rather worldly and, uh, and ungodly, and here is someone in the church who's exceeded them all. Okay, now notice verse 2, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken from among you. All right, instead of responding correctly in dealing with this, they have become rather arrogant, resistant to the truth, uh, they have uh, just allowed this to continue on, even though only one man is involved in this. You have others that are in the congregation that it, it's a matter of, of their of pride or a matter that, that they're not dealing with. And uh, with, with any kind of, of rebuke, with any kind of correction that may come, all right, do not meet this with the same kind of attitude. Do not meet this with, with this same kind of, of arrogance, with the same kind of, of Corinthian pride. Don't do that because this has to be corrected and it has to be corrected now. And he makes mention that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You allow for this, and I would argue this isn't a little leaven, even though it is just one man, just one man. This is not a little leaven. You allow this to occur, then things are going to get worse. It is going to spread. You cannot take flour, put leaven in it, 
and just some of the, the flour is going to be leavened. It's, it's all going to be leavened. Every bit of it is going to be influenced by the leaven. And so this has to be purged. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to purge out that old lump. You've got to purge out that, that dough. You've got to start all over again, or rather, you have, to, you have to make the correction. And the correction is, this brother in Christ has to repent of this. Or you can't have anything to do with him. You can't. And he is uh, uh, speaking to, to them, and some of them are resistant to him. Some of them are, are very much re resistant to him. And uh, they, he, he has to defend, Paul, writing 1 Corinthians, has to defend his apostleship. Uh, has to defend uh, his works. There are things that they, he has to say concerning himself that he wouldn't have otherwise, um, uh, simply because they were questioning, uh, not just a, a matter of questioning, they, they actually become antagonistic to him, trying to undermine anything that he may teach, uh, whether in, in word or uh, uh, spoken or written. Now, we come back to Hebrews chapter 13, and in this, and I appeal to you, brethren, so here's these, here is these, these, uh, these requests, final remarks, uh, basic information, and, and close. He said, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, because he's been doing that since uh, we, we see that in places such as uh, chapter 6 and verse 9 where he says, But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. All right, there's, there's greater things that were expected out of them. And bear with this. Do the right thing. You can resist it, and it won't be good, and you'll never grow, and you'll just go back out in the world, or you can grow from, from this exhortation. Now know that our brother Timothy has been set free. So, uh, uh, so they know Timothy, and Timothy's been in prison, uh, has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Okay, so uh, our Timothy has been, has been set free, and here's another reason why we know the writer will see them soon. But he asked them to pray that he can see them sooner yet. Because he says, with whom, that's with Timothy, I shall see you if he comes shortly. So if, if Timothy is, is able to get there in time, that they'll both, they'll both be there. And uh, uh, that it, because he expects to, it, it would appear from this that this writer could see them quicker than Timothy could. Though Timothy has, has been released. He's been set free. Okay. And uh, uh, the author wants to see them, and evidently Timothy wants to see them as well. Verse 24 Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. So here's another fact we have about the author. The author is in Italy when he's writing. Now, some will take this and say, I know it's Paul. Okay, that's great. But you don't know. You don't know. And I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out. Because it's, it's it, what difference does it make anyway? What difference if it happens to be Paul, or if it happens to be Silas, or it happens to be uh, any, of the, any of the others, that, or, or even someone we, we don't even have a name for? What does it matter? It's still inspired of God, and s such speculation really is just a waste of time, in my opinion. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with studying the book and that's one of the things that you're trying to glean, glean more about the author. 
But there comes a point when, okay, you're not gleaning anymore. You're not gathering facts anymore. You're just speculating. Could this be Paul? Yes, it could be Paul. Could it be Timothy? No, it can't be Timothy. Timothy wouldn't be saying these things about himself. Uh, could it be uh, someone like Peter? Well, unless Peter had gone to uh, Italy. Yeah, it could be Peter, I suppose. But, uh, but no, this is, uh, this, we don't know who this is. But whoever it is, is in Italy. Yes, ma'am. Oh, he's been set from prison. Yeah, he was in prison, according to this, but he's been set free. Uh-uh. Nope. No, there, there are things like with, uh, with certain people, we don't know uh, a lot. W Timothy, we know that Timothy had, had been to certain places. We do know that. But where he was put into prison, we don't know. Um, at all. Uh, he never was, as far as I know, he never was in prison with Paul. That's neither here nor there. Uh, but, uh, but Timothy, Timothy has been set free. Uh, whoever this is, is not with Timothy and happens to be in Italy and happens to be with brethren in Italy. Uh, could this be Rome? Yeah, but it could also be somewhere else in Italy. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't exactly know. And then the last words in this, grace be to you all, amen. There's the last words in this. There's this, these, these final parting words. He hopes to see them. He hopes to see them sooner than what it looks like he's going to be able to. How far is he going to have to travel from Italy? Don't know. But the, uh, whoever he's writing to is not in Italy. Where are they? How long will it take to get there? Don't know. Uh, but uh, it's possible from the text, it's possible that Timothy will uh, see the writer and that the two of them would go on to see whoever this congregation is. That's a, that's a distinct possibility. That's a very distinct possibility. But it's also that uh, the writer knows or has plans on seeing them and it's in the category of soon, which is, I mean, how soon is soon? It could be months. It could be in, in the ancient day, in, in this ancient world, soon could mean sometime next year. You know, don't know. Have, have no idea. But he, he planned on being there and knew that Timothy also planned on being there as well. Uh, so these last words, grace be with you all, amen, closing it out. And with uh, those he's writing to, we don't know any of their names. We don't know where they are, uh, but we can gather, we can gather from all this that they are in a congregation. He, he is writing to a congregation and they, that they are Jews and that he too, the writer, is also Jewish. We can gather that. And um, uh, aside from the fact that, as we've made mention weeks ago, that uh, the oldest, oldest uh, texts, uh, oldest copies of this book uh, does title the book uh, the book of, well, Hebrews, to the Hebrews. Now, there are some things that I want to talk about concerning the book, and that the book of Hebrews is loaded, loaded, and this is not an exhaustive thing, what I'm about to go through at all. It's not exhaustive. Uh, but it's showing several examples of where implication and inference are being used. The author infers what earlier writers implied, and he also shows how someone like Abraham also used inference with what he had been told. 
that he had been told certain things, and those certain things implied something. And he, Abraham recognized it. And so the author is showing, and this is, this is a beautiful thing uh, about uh, uh, the Bible, the biblical text. Biblical text teaches the way we learn. We learn by way of direct command. We learn by way of example, good and bad. All right? Learn to, uh, from the good and you imitate that. You learn from the bad and you avoid that. We also learn by way of inference, what's known as necessary inference. Something can uh, be implied by something that was said. Something, uh, let's just say uh, we have a fact. The fact is A, fact A. We know fact A and we have fact B. And those two being a fact means that C must also be a fact. Even though A didn't say it, B didn't say it, for those two to be true, putting them together, we can know that C must also be true. It must be. That's called necessary inference. And we have the old thing of, you know, if, if Jeff is taller than John and John is taller than Bill, we know that Jeff is taller than Bill, though nobody said it. We know that. Because if, if I get my names correct, Jeff is taller than John, John is taller than Bill, therefore we know that Jeff is taller. That's fact A. Fact A, Jeff has got to be talking, taller than Bill. That's, that's necessary inference. How would Bill somehow be taller than Jeff? Well, under all this, he couldn't be. Not logically, he couldn't be. Uh, but Let's look at just briefly some of the implications and inferences. Things that were implied in the Old Testament and the writer is using inference to reason from it. And he's done it numerous times. Numerous times, especially in the beginning of the book. Especially. It's just one after another, after another, after another. Let's just go to Hebrews chapter 1. And we, uh, we just begin in uh, verse 3. Who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down, this talking about Christ, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, to, for to which of the angels did He ever say, this is Jehovah speaking, this is from Psalm 2, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. All right, the question is, to which angel did Jehovah ever say that? To none. So there's an implication here. There's, there's an implication that Jesus must be greater than the angels, which is precisely what He says in this. Having become so much better than the angels. And then He goes from there. I will be to Him a father and He shall be to me a son. That's 2 Samuel. 7, uh, 12 through 14, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. And he continues on. He continues on in this to show how from past scripture, how it must be the case that Christ is far greater than the angels. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's saying, it basically saying, which angel did he ever say this to? It would, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't matter because the answer is none of them. To which angel did he ever say this? None of them. Michael, Gabriel, Apollyon, who? There is, you don't know. Because he never did. He never did. There is no, uh, well, we can know this. There's no scripture where he ever says it. But for, for the Son, for Jesus, he did. For the Christ, for the Messiah, he did. You are my Son, today I have begotten you. No other, no one else. No one else. And that he is implying, or rather, he's inferring, 
inferring from Scripture, this is what was said to the angels. This is what was said to the Christ. Show me where this was ever said to any of the angels. Well, he didn't say it to any of the angels, nor did he have to say, nor did he have to specify, and I don't mean any angels. You are my son today, I have begotten you, and I don't mean any angels. He didn't have to say that because he has specified the Christ. So there, he is reasoning from the silence of the Scriptures. Aside from that he said this to the Christ, did he also say the same thing to the angels? Well, you have no proof of it. It's not there. And that's because he never did. He never did do it. Okay, so here in going from Hebrews 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 4, the writer infers from seven passages, all coming from the Old Testament. Psalm 2, 7, 2 Samuel 7, 12, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 43, Psalm 104, 4, Psalm 45, 6 through 7, Psalm 102, 25 to 27, Psalm 110, 1. He uses all those. Here is the message that is there, and this is what he infers from it because it is what's known as necessary inference necessary inference of it must be true. If this is true, then I can know these other things must also be true. I know it must also be true. And uh, this is just this long string of uh, one inference to the next and proving a point, proving a point that Christ is greater, Christ is just greater in, in making that point of here's a scripture, 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 and reasoning from all that, reasoning from it. And of course, we know scripture will not contradict itself ever. If, and let's just throw this out, if you ever think that scripture has contradicted itself, it could be that your interpretation of one scripture is off, or it could be you don't know either scripture. One's going to be the fact. Either you don't know one scripture and the other one is trying to show you, you know, this one isn't pointing the direction you think it is. It's actually pointing this direction, if, uh, but they're not going to be contradictory. And it could be that you don't know either scripture at all, uh, which is often the case. And I, I hear it all the time of where uh, someone gives a, a uh, oh, I just saw it. It's it's laughable, actually. It was, it was uh, one of these uh, marches here most recently, one of these pro-abortion marches. And they, someone always has to show something from the Bible, and they don't know what they're talking about. They absolutely don't. And they're hoping you don't either. Um, they, and it was just a list of scriptures proving that abortion is okay. Just a list of scriptures. And yeah, nah, uh, it's not working. Okay, you don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea. And honestly, people that corrupt, they don't care. That person, you think that person actually cares about the Bible? No. Uh, okay, what about, <laughs> what about these other scriptures talking about the value of human life? What about that? What about that one? And what about, if there's, that particular person is probably all over the place morally. Uh, if, you're, if you're that corrupt, they're all over the place morally. And, and somehow they're going to try to play the, the moral high ground by just listing scriptures. And probably knowing that most people won't even look them up. They're not going to, oh, is that really? Is that what it said? Okay, well, I guess this is okay then. Uh, it's ignorance playing off of ignorance, or just deception playing off of ignorance. Now, let's get back to where we are. In Hebrews 4, verses 5 through 9, the writer concludes through Scripture, and this would be uh, Psalm 95, uh, and the book of Joshua, not just Psalm 95, but also the book of Joshua, that there's a future rest for the righteous. 
Okay? One could say, well, why did he waste time doing that when we sort of already knew that? But he's using, he's using old, very old scriptures, even when this was written, very old scriptures to show this has always been true. This has been true. And he's showing by way of inference that it had to have been implied when these things were written in Psalm 95 and also earlier than that in the book of Joshua. But they both concern uh, that of, of Israel in the wilderness and also coming into the promised land under Joshua. Now, Hebrews chapter 6, 12 and 14, the writer uses inference to conclude Jesus could not be priest under the Old Testament law because he's not of the tribe of Levi, but of Judah. And he is teaching from the silence of the Scriptures. We go to chapter 6, we go to verse 12, that you do not become... Hang on. Okay, I have the wrong Scripture. I have put down the wrong thing. That is obvious that I've done that. We will find that. Okay. Um, it is, I, I, am, I am off on that. I have put down the wrong chapter. I know I have. Okay. Yeah, it's chapter 7. Chapter 7, uh, 12, and, uh, 12 to 14. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. By necessity, there has to be a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Okay? Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. He could not be in the Levitical priesthood. That would be against the law of Moses. That would be against the law of God under that older law. But as he says, the law had to be changed. There had to be a change of the law. That law is fulfilled under Christ. Christ dies on the cross. That's where the old law headed. That is its conclusion, to bring in the Messiah and the Messiah dies for the sins of the world. That is it. And also with his death, it, that Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Law being fulfilled, there is a change in the law. Hence, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ. And he says, For he of whom these things are spoken, that would be Jesus, belongs to another tribe for which no man has officiated on the altar. So you, no one of the tribe of Judah has ever officiated at the altar. They haven't done it. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. That means silence of the Scriptures. When one tribe is specified, Levi, that means all other tribes are excluded. Everything else is excluded. It's Levi. So how could Jesus be a priest under the old covenant? He couldn't. He couldn't be. But under new covenant, yeah, he can be. And he is. Not only is he priest, he is high priest. Uh, now, in Hebrews 7, 1 through 28, the writer takes this entire chapter to reason through inference that Christ as high priest and that the order of Melchizedek is far greater than the Levitical priesthood because Jesus is high priest forever. There's no change in priesthood. There's no change in, in the high priest ever. There's no change there at all. Uh, as we spoke when we were back in chapter 7, that there would be times when you'd have a very good high priest, and there'd be times when you'd have a, a bad high priest. You'd have a bad one. Uh, take Caiaphas. Right? There'd be times when uh, the high priest is not so good. But here we have an eternal high priest who is better, who is perfect. And, and 
here in all of this, chapter 7, taking that, that whole chapter to teach by way of inference that Jesus is a greater high priest, that the uh, priesthood of the order of Melchizedek is a greater priesthood than Levi ever was. And part of that is showing that of, of uh, who gave tithes to whom. Going back to Genesis chapter 14 with Abram giving, that would be Abraham, giving tithes to Melchizedek. And it wouldn't be for centuries that until you would have a, a well, the tribe of Levi to even become the priesthood. Okay, uh, now uh, the writer tells us that Abraham uses, so here's an example of uh, inference. Here's an example of inference, and this is one of those places where I, I say that the, the Bible is extraordinary because it will, it will uh, imply something, then show later, okay, this is what was implied. This is, this is a conclusion from what was implied by this old passage, such as Psalm 95, such as Psalm 110 and 4, or Psalm 110 and 1, all of which is in the book of Hebrews, showing, all right, this is what was said. All right, let's look at what that fully means. Let's look at what was implied so we make an inference on that. Now, also in it is not only is the biblical text showing this is what you do with with passages, yeah, you can, you can make implication or inference off of them. But also, here's an example of someone doing it, and they did it right. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 19, is an example of Abraham using inference with what God told him to where he knew, the promises that God told him to where he knew very well that if he were to kill Isaac as a sacrifice, that God would raise him up from the dead. All right, we spoke of that when we were in Hebrews 11, but notice that we have an example now of someone using the, the reasoning, reasoning from Scripture, and something was implied. And just to to bring that out in case someone didn't, wasn't, didn't see that or didn't hear that portion of these lessons, that God gave Abraham promises that in Isaac, in Isaac his seed would be called, in, from Isaac there would be a great nation. All right, if you kill Isaac and he's young, he's just a boy, you kill him and he's just a boy, well, where goes those promises? Where are those promises of him becoming a great nation? If, you, if he's going to die a, a small boy and he has no children, he can't be. Therefore, Abraham, believing God, knew that God telling him, go sacrifice Isaac. Sac uh, Isaac is to be a burnt sacrifice. He knows that God's going to raise him from the dead. He knows it because he's got, he already has the assurances that God says there is a future for Isaac, and it's got to be beyond that sacrifice. It's got to be beyond that, because at that point in time, he has no children. So there's faith for you. That is, that's a, a, an extremely good reason why uh, Abraham is regarded as the father of the faithful. And we are to imitate that faith, because he, he could reason from what God told him to know, okay, yeah, I can trust God. I can know this. I can, and, and uh, now, there was one example of inference being used by a righteous man. Now, I just want to go quickly, speaking of examples, there are examples given in the book of Hebrews, and we're just discussing this as, yes, in the book of Hebrews, we can see uh, implication and inference. We can see the use of examples, and we can also see the use of direct commands. Okay, and among the examples, chapter 11 is filled with examples going from Abel, who's the first one discussed, to Samuel, who's the last name mentioned. 
There are a lot of other deeds. There are other deeds that are mentioned that no name is given to them, and probably it would be a great many people, not just one person by name. Possibly. Uh, we also have in chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, Jesus as an example. An example of His faith, example of Him overcoming. Uh, 13, cha uh, chapter 13, verse 7, saying that uh, imitate those who, who rule over you. Saying that uh, whose faith follow. So this would be someone living, in their, living among them. That yeah, you follow their faith. There's an example for you to follow. That there are examples given from the, the, the text of to follow. But here are others also living with their following uh, the same path of the, as these others earlier. They're, they're, uh, they're living faithfully. You, you can see them personally. You follow them. We also have bad examples to avoid. Hebrews 3, verse 7 to 4, 11. It's Psalm 95, and it's Israel in the wilderness. And what God says there in Psalm 95 concerning them. So we're to avoid that. Hebrews 12, 16, and 17, it's Enoch by name, avoiding his example because he's a bad example. We also have direct statements, and it's usually I don't have to tell people concerning direct statements because they, they automatically think the Bible is nothing but direct statements. But just Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, so here's direct statements. These are what you are to do and also what you're not to do, not forsaking the assembling of yourself. Here we have both positive and negative in this. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Uh, and we have... We have run out of time, and uh, so I want to thank everybody for being with us in this class. It has been uh, a, really a pleasure to go through this book, and uh, I hope that we can all be strengthened by it, having a greater understanding of it, and there is more to learn, and I'm talking about for myself. As I've said before in this class, every time I read this book, just like any other book in the Bible, every time I read this book, I'll see something and think, now how did I miss that? How did I miss that? I thought I was thorough. How did I miss that? And then it's, I'm always modifying my notes. I'm always modifying things. I'm, I'm seeing, oh, well, here's something else teaching me this, or here's something else that is there blatantly, and I just went, I just rolled right over that, and it just did not occur to me. It happens all the time. And I will say this, we're not going to do it, but I will say this, if we were to start in chapter 1 again and do it again, there would be information come out the second go-around that was not in the first go-around. There would be. It always happens. There, you cannot plumb the depth. You cannot reach the, the bottom of Scripture and say, well, we've exhausted this, we've outgrown this. We won't. Extraordinary book. And uh, next week we'll start on a, another study, another book, and uh, the book of James is what we're looking at. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being with us.